Dungeon Law, Part 2. Yosef the Intolerant by Ilitha. There are many legendary gladiators who have made their names in the Blessed Crucible. Among them, Felhorn, Sarnel the Great, and Alaris the Shroud are known for their formidable combat prowess and fighting spirit. But others, like Yosef the Intolerant, have become famous for other reasons. Let me first say that the Blessed Crucible of Skyrim features an amazing array of competitors, with combatants arriving from all over Tamriel to test their mettle. In this time of warring alliances, it's not just anywhere that an Ultima would drag a wounded orc to safety, or where a Redguard would so readily step into an arrow's path for an Argonian, but the Blessed Crucible is one such place. In the Crucible, one's team is one's nation, and the struggle for the brimstone crown, the national religion. However, there was one man, a young gladiator named Yosef. He came from the Breton Lion Guard and was fresh-faced, decent with a blade. None questioned that he was a healthy boy ready to take the Crucible by storm. But Yosef could never understand the social phenomenon of the Crucible and trusted only other Bretons. He could not fathom the fact that gladiators must place their trust in their teams, not in the gladiators of the same race. Said gladiator Oberel, Our match began and this Breton boy sent his Khajiiti team member sprawling to the ground. Then he looked me in the eye, blinked twice. Slowly, is he trying to wink, whispered my ally Dumont. We capitalized on their folly and beat the boy in the Khajiit unconscious. One must never refuse such strokes of fortune in the Blessed Crucible. As time passed, young Yosef grew increasingly frustrated. He scoffed at suggestions to collaborate with gladiators of other races. His demeanor incensed the Crucible audience, along with its competitors, and management loved him for it. We would print Yosef's face on currency if we could. He is a boon to us, they said. The gladiators felt differently. Said Dalu the Dunmary Blade, Eosef told me he would never collaborate with a Kwama farmer, and he hounded me every day for Kwama eggs. He was certain that I had some, or could by some miracle produce them? I have never even tasted a Kwama egg. I was born in Skyrim. Said Etherin, the rabid Dunma, Eosef repeatedly referred to me as Dalu. Said Azrukana, the Crimson Cat, I told him he could trust me in battle, that he needed to if he wanted to live for much longer as a gladiator. He rasped his voice and said, This one thinks you should have some moon sugar and keep your opinions to yourself. I did not like that. Said Inafar, the Skyforged Razor. When Harasvard, my comrade of a decade, was slain in combat, I went to the Hall of Champions and I wept. That Breton boy found me and said, Did you run out of mead coin? I know how that feels, but unlike you Nords, I wouldn't cry about it. The beating that ensued in Hasvrad's honor lasted eight minutes. Low Gladiator has gained as much infamy as Yosef in so short a time, but he soon disappeared. His current whereabouts are unknown. Soul Trapping One, an introduction. By Warlock Alinian. Pardon the lengthy discussion of morality to follow. We shall reach the meat of this meal, the actual procedure of soul trapping, soon enough. I was compelled to include an introductory chapter to this revised version of soul trapping after the ethical arguments that sprang from the publication of the first edition. Soul trapping is the art of taking a creature's soul upon death and confining it into an appropriately sized phylactery. Throughout the history of magic, mages and philosophers alike have battled back and forth about the morality of the art. Some mages would argue once dead the soul trapped, a creature's spirit is merely an echo of its previous life, no longer aware of what goes on around it. Even those rare individuals who become phantasmal hunters lurking in the darkness of Tamriel are nothing more than predators acting on natural impulses. To these mages, once dead, an individual loses some spark, some intangible element in a biological death that cannot be regained. 
As such, they argue, soul trapping is not unethical. In fact, it's a waste of resources to leave the soul of the deceased free. Of course, we the living, being still alive, can never know for certain. Theories regarding the afterlife are myriad, but even the most powerful mages in Tamriel have never returned from Death's Reach to report their level of awareness in that state. As such, there are those in the communities of Tamriel, both magical and not, that decry the use of soul-trapping spells. The eccentric archmages Elomurim of the First Era famously asked, Would you like to spend your afterlife powering my levitation star? The Archmages claimed to have never used a soul-trapping spell in all his years. Adding some weight to the argument is the rumor that one such soul has retained a very mortal sentience in entrapment. If rumors are true, the Alt Mary royalty have utilized an advanced form of soul-trapping to imprison some ancient Kai Kinlord for the duration of his afterlife. Perhaps one of the realists? That lot is notoriously manic, and their souls must be doubly so. The High King Lord has reportedly maintained his, its, faculties, daunting and jeering his keepers on a daily basis. I do not know where this Lord King Lord might be, and I do not want to know. I'd like to keep my head. But his very existence speaks to how aware a soul can be, and the morality of soul trapping can be further postulated from there. What do I believe about the subject? I've written ten volumes on trapping souls, instructional, theoretical, and historical in nature, and I cannot answer that question. It is my belief you won't be able to either. But what you can answer is whether the material I teach in the following volumes is worth using. All I ask is that you read them. Tempest Island Briefing You have your orders, Alderal, and you'll execute them as well as you always do. But I wanted to apologize again for this assignment. It would have never been necessary had the Cannon Reeves not dissolved my plans for a garrison at Tempest Island. I had drawn requisitions to bring a fleet of swan ships, enough to repel any force of long-range vessels from Pyanderia to defend the island. The request was denied. We can deal with the Marma after the Pact and the Covenant, they said, citing a lack of resources to devote to my unfounded apprehension. So I reminded a few of my acquaintances of favors owed from conflicts long past and managed to send a few scout ships. They reported unusual weather phenomena in the first week, swift lightning storms off the coast that came and went in moments. The second week, the storms intensified, and under cover of inclement weather came a fleet of warships, chitinous hulls with opalescent sails, decks illuminated with sparks of lightning staves and swords, Malma war material, just as we remembered them. My scouts estimated their forces small, not full-scale invasion fleet, but the coast of Malabar Tour will, will be entirely at their mercy when they decide to attack. Had the Cannon Reeves taken just a moment from their maps tracking the movement of orcs and men, they'd see that a dire threat was growing under their noses. Every week my scouts reported an increase in Malma strength, a few ships every few days appearing under the cover of some kind of weather magic. Months too late, the cannonries agree with me, now. I know we must ask much from you and your soldiers, but if you don't stop them, Alderil, the Dominion will have yet another front to fight in this war. More than any Daedra, more than the Ebonheart Pact, more than the Daggerfall Covenant, the Maoma want the ultimate choked from existence. They always have. Show them no quarter. The Art of Kwama Egg Cooking, an introduction by Balami Levaso. Kwama eggs have always been a Dunmeri delicacy, though I've heard they've found their way into Imperial kitchens too. Who knows what grisly dishes that lot would make with Kwama eggs? Would they stuff chickens with them, poach them, and put them in a bap? They are a disdainful people, and they make disdainful food. To cook a kwama egg with any measure of success is to master the sharp, sour flavor and the gummy texture. Kwama eggs are similar to scrib jelly in this way, and many a young chef, even Dunmary chefs whose elders should have better taught them, has attempted to mask the eggs behind other ingredients, to camouflage the perceived unpleasantness. 
This is an abominable practice. A chef should never apologize for a quam egg in her dishes by sweetening or embitteringing them. If the dish is properly prepared, supporting the quam egg's natural qualities, a cultured diner will embrace the meal in all its pungent glory. But what does that preparation entail? Only a Dunma could tell you, because only the Dunma have found of lifetimes of experience and necessarily to call ourselves culinary masters of the Kwama egg. It was we, after all, who first attained the Kwama. I, in turn, have spent a large proportion of my years, of which there are many, immersing myself in the art. I have served Kwama eggs to peasants and paupers, grand masters and grand mistresses, and delighted them all. And you, dear reader, will find within these volumes the combined knowledge of my entire career. It takes a lifetime of cooking Kwama eggs to truly understand the subtle but brilliant differences between the various methods of preparation, and I've catalogued them all here, all the ones of worth at least. Follow these recipes exactly, just as a maid should hesitate in improvising her spellcasting, lest she find a daedra in her drawing room. The Kwama egg chef should not stray from the paths I've laid out here, painstakingly crafted from years of trial and error. Believe me, if it works, I've found it. And put that moon sugar away. You'll insult the eggs. The Binding Stone. The Keeper's Primer, Volume 2. The Binding Stone. From the Office of the Canon Reeve of Corrections. Altmeri texts reference many variations of the entrapment spell. Some of those spells, like the early First Era and Lair's Tower, create physical fields around their targets. These varieties are unbreachable unless broken by an appropriate amount of force, like conjured stone walls or shield wards turned inwards. The effect differs in strength from spell to spell, but it is generally effective for containing the layman prisoner, and certainly tougher to break free from than brick and mortar. Of course, sometimes a mage seeks to confine creatures that walls won't hold, magical or otherwise. Gaseous forms of the wild hunt, nether liches, and various ghosts and phantoms all have means to escape physical barriers. These must be imprisoned using spells that create completely impermeable surfaces, while absorbing or stemming the magicka of their captives. These spells must be reincarnated constantly to avoid consuming themselves, usually at high cost of magicka for the caster. The Binding Stone, which your head keeper will soon introduce you to if he hasn't already, functions as a combination of these spells. It's tangible, small, and therefore portable, but capable of holding all manner of magical wielding creatures, even ones as powerful as your charge. I'm sure you understand the grave nature of what the prisoner's escape would mean, both to you personally, and to Oridon and Tamriel as a whole. The condition of the Binding Stone is more important than the condition of your prisoner. Indeed, your very lives depend on the upkeep and maintenance of the stone. As for your prisoner, do not look at him, do not speak to him. There is no specific danger in doing so, but any such interaction is a fruitless venture. Watch yourself, watch each other, do your duty, and your name will live forever among those who have committed everything to shield Oridon from this menace. I hope you've been enjoying these lore readings, and if you have, please do consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks oh. for watching.